Ah, the green belt. Nine out of ten Ontarians agree that it's a great place to go for a rip. But it is currently in the process of being ripped up. And the people who are at fault probably aren't who you think. Or maybe they are. Place your bets now! Over the last few videos, I've been parsing the current government of Ontario's work to address the housing crisis. These laws and policy changes are complex, which means people don't understand them, which means people often fall back on simpler political heuristics. Political party bad. Problem is, as always, the government is much more than one person or the current party in charge. The bills passed represent a mix of interests and ideas tugging on policies. There is no doubt, Bill 23 is developer friendly, but a good first stumble in the direction of cheaper and denser housing which has the support of many housing advocates and technocrats too. Bill 3 and 39 are the strong mayor bills, probably unnecessary, probably going to create another problem, but it's pretty easy to repeal if that happens. But if you want to see the uncomplicated part of the reforms, let's talk about this fucking thing. This is the Ontario Greenbelt, and it's as close as I plan to get to nature this year. And this stupid fucking government managed to ruin any positive energy around their housing reforms by pointlessly poking this thing. Now, I'm not a fan of hard greenbelts like the one here in Ontario. I think that they've worked out horrendously in implementation and are in serious need of reform. But one thing is pretty clear. If you are going to build on an agricultural land reserve, you better have an excellent reason and a transformational plan to make environmentally responsible use of the land. But this government's plan is so... Hmm... Starts with C, don't have a liability insurance to say it, and also incompetent. So let's get into the corruption side of things. The Green Belt was created in 2005 by the Ontario Liberal government, and it really pissed off developers. Like really did. Many of them fueled their production pipeline with land on the edge of the urban areas. The belt slammed closed the valve for them. It was the last time there was this much scandal around the green belt. But back in 2005, the debate was about which developers had gotten special favours to have their land excluded. The green belt controversy erupted last week when it was revealed that Mr. De Gasparis attended an exclusive Liberal Party fundraiser last May while the boundaries for the green belt were being drawn up. Land he owns in Vaughan was excluded from the green belt after he met with Municipal Affairs Minister John Gerritsen and his staff last May 4th. Ontario Finance Minister Greg Sorbara, who described Mr. De Gasparis as a friend, denied that the developer was able to buy access to government officials. Some of them took the loss and sold up. Some of them held on to it, believing that at some point in the future it would inevitably be developed. Over the last two decades, the Greenbelt has proven broadly popular in Ontario for both rational and emotional reasons. Homeowners should like it on an economic level because it has helped keep housing prices high. But most people, even the renters who lose out on the housing advantage, just like the serenity. Anyway, last election, provincial politicians campaigned as usual on keeping the Greenbelt untouched. Leave only skidoo trails, take only soft fruit. But after the election, thrown into the mix of all these more nuanced housing bills was a proposed reallocation of the Greenbelt to support municipal partners in achieving the provincial housing target. That target? 1.5 million homes, which isn't going to be helped by the 50,000 coming out of Greenbelt. There's also tons of agricultural land that's not in the Greenbelt, the so-called White Belt. You see, this isn't actually the Greenbelt. Haha, <laughs> I got ya! The Greenbelt is just over there. It's exactly the same, it's just undeveloped agricultural land. So really, the question is, why take more food from a buffet when you haven't even finished what's on your plate? The worst part of this is the corruption on display again. Of the 15 areas being removed, at least 10 contained properties sold since 2018, when the current government came into power. But is that just the usual rate that these properties change hands? Well. Prior to 2018, properties were being sold at a rate of one every 26 months. Afterwards, a suspicious sales frenzy started and the rate changed to one every five months. And it included a familiar name. The buyer was TAC Developments, controlled by prominent developer Silvio de Gasparis and members of his family. But with these things, you don't really need a conspiracy theory. Valuable and interesting information always leaks eventually. Markets are extremely motivated to find things out. It's fairly obvious that someone in the chain, from a premier to the GIS person creating the maps, shared information with the industry. With that information, developers bought properties that on December the 21st, 2022, became many times more valuable. Some of them may have just been 
following others or guessing this government would cave. But due to a leaky, opaque, non-system run by politicians and political insiders, this is the shit sandwich Ontarians are being given to eat. So there's the corruption problem, then there's the incompetence problem. The government has given these municipalities until 2025 to get shovels in the ground on the Greenbelt. But unlike the White Belt, municipalities had no plans to develop the Greenbelt. Instead of any planning, it's just blah, houses, now, faster, faster, faster. There's no time to find funding for rapid transit, no transit first developments. The reallocations in Hamilton are not even enough land for a large hub. And it's near an airport, so it can't be that dense. Also, Hamilton's urban planners, from what I've seen behind me, are obviously not very visionary. They're not gonna pull together a walkable, transit-oriented, mixed-use community for remote workers with transit connections to the GO train downtown and tie it in with an airport link. I've seen these developments that they're allowing in a greenfield development not too far from here that's less than a kilometer away from a rail corridor. And it just looks like you'd asked a traffic engineer to design a community that would generate a traffic jam. The fix? Well, corruption investigation and lawsuits aside, at this point, the dumbass horse has bolted. We're at the doing better next time stage. So what is doing better? Well, planning for one. If it was a benefit to setting up the green belt beyond the green, it was that we had decades to intentionally plan any removals from it. Pretending that no urban boundary expansion could ever happen was very naive. All municipal governments that border agricultural land reserves should have pre-selected land and plans they could use if required to expand. What is happening is an unplanned land lottery where some land becomes 10 times more valuable overnight and those lucky and connected developers capture the difference of the government making a paperwork change. An actual process, an actual plan, would remove the drama each time of which developer got what favour. And when the land is removed from the Greenbelt, it should be acquired at a fair market price by the government. Right now, the winnings from the lottery go to well-connected private developers. Instead, the increase in value of the land should be captured and used to fund services for the neighbourhood. Could help bring down development charges. So why is this happening? Why does any of this happen? Because it's politically possible. Housing in Ontario has gotten this bad because local voters created municipalities that opposed densification, opposed expansion, and opposed increased taxes. Take a look at Hamilton. Downtown Hamilton is a sea of car parks. Where's the density, dickheads? Where is the vacant land tax? Just beside it are detached single-family homes with pools in the backyard. The city recently established a zero urban boundary growth plan, but it's inexplicably still building some of the worst suburban sprawl I've seen. The city amalgamated in 2001 and it still hasn't standardized the zoning decades later across the former cities because the city is afraid to bump the former suburban cities up to a higher density standard. The city recently started talking about multiplexes, the sort of cost-effective missing middle housing which the Provincial Housing Affordability Task Force has as a headline priority for ending this crisis. But as usual here, things are moving so slow. They have recently made plexes legal, but only on existing buildings. So now a large house can legally be called two different residences. But it's all paperwork. That doesn't create any more bedrooms. Hamilton represents much of a province, much of a continent really. Environmentalism, as long as I can have a backyard pool and barbecue. Affordable housing, as long as my taxes don't go up. Well, those attentive municipalities listened to their voters, but in doing so, they created the conditions that made a thwacking from the province inevitable. There are hundreds of policies that the province could use to help create housing supply. Everything from funding construction apprenticeships to decontaminating land to, yes, building housing in the Greenbelt. What Ontario shows is that if you don't handle a low vacancy rate maturely at the municipal level, at some point you're going to end up getting a bunch of policies dictated by a higher level of government and many local voters and municipalities won't like it. But the provincial government wouldn't have been able to pull all of this off if housing hadn't stressed out so many people that reallocating Greenbelt land became politically viable. Instead of being outraged, lots of people feeling that stress are saying something like, you know, Canada is huge and I'm really scared I'll never have housing security in my life. I choose a house over a Greenbelt. Which they wouldn't say if they felt safe and securely housed. Housing will only remain a local government responsibility while local governments are being responsible. 
So the best thing that you can do to keep your city deciding its own future is support building more housing in your neighborhood. If you don't, then at some point, a random pile of dictated policies, which you're almost guaranteed to not like, will be coming to your town. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! <laughs> Leave only skidoo trails, take only soft fruit. I, I wonder what soft fruit is. Is it like grapes? Ice wine? Is it, is that where ice wine, is this where ice wine comes from? Oh, I miss talking to Yuta, he's not here today. It's fucking cold.